welcome to uh, another interesting webinar on Mumbai Hematology under the aegis of Mumbai Hematology Group. And we at INTRAS are extremely proud to collaborate and partner. Our program director, Professor Dr. M.B. Agarwasar, is traveling, but I'm sure he has logged in and or he'll be logging in. And this pattern of his is very ably carried forward by Dr. Amit Khurana. We all know him very, very well. You can see him on the screen today. Extremely passionate about clinical research, hematology, hemato-oncology, and bone marrow transplant. A leading hemato-oncologist from western part of the country, Surat. Sir, we are thankful and grateful to you to take it forward from here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manoj Kumar, for that kind of words. Good morning, all of you, and good afternoon and good evening from whichever part of the world you are from. Today, our guest speaker is Dr. Anand Deshpande from Mumbai. He's going to lecture us on advances in blood transfusion medicine of relevance to a clinical hematologist. This webinar is brought to you by Mumbai Hematology Group, supported by INTAS and perfectly managed by Perfect Square. I thank Dr. Manoj Kumar and team INTAS Mr. Yash, Mr. Kalpesh, and the team Perfect Square, Executive Committee of Mumbai Hematology Group, our chief guest for the day, Professor Jyoti Kotwal from New Delhi, our guest speaker, Dr. Anand Deshpande from Mumbai, all our discussants who are themselves eminent hematologists and hemato-oncologists or transmission medicine specialists, and you participants for sparing your Sunday morning, afternoon, or evening from whichever the part of the world you are from. Next Saturday, that is on 19th of November, we have got an excellent lecture that on what's new in ITP by our guest speaker, Dr. Cindy Newnut from USA. And the following day, that is on Sunday, 20th November, we have a lecture on optimum vaccination for hematological patients by Dr. Aisha Chamshe Sunawala from Mumbai. It's now time to introduce all our discussions and we have a galaxy of them have been displaced in alphabetical order. To start with, we have Dr. Ankur Ahuja from RNR Army Hospital, New Delhi, Dr. Amita Mahajan from Indrapras Apollo Hospital, New Delhi, Dr. Amrita Sarap from Sar Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi, Dr. Atish Narayan Rao Bakane from Indrapras Apollo Hospital, New Delhi, Dr. Tulika Sheth from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, Dr. Jagdish Chandra from ESI Model Hospital and PGI MSR, New Delhi, Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Kundan Mishra from RNR Army Hospital, New Delhi. Dr. Manisha Srivastava from Ames, Bhopal. Dr. Mukul Agarwal from Ames, New Delhi. Dr. Nidhi Mehta from MCGM Comprehensive Thalassemia Center, CARE, Pediatric Hematology Oncology and BMT Center from Borivali, Mumbai. Dr. Rajat Jain from Sayadri Super Specialty Hospital, Pune. Dr. Rajesh Shavan from KD Ambani Hospital, Mumbai. Dr. Rajkumar Ramaswamy from Velamal Speciality Hospital, Madurai. Colonel Dr. S. Venkatesan from Armed Force Medical College, Pune. And Dr. Tejaswini Kodibandi from Mazumdar Show Medical Center, Naran Health, Bangalore. It is time to introduce our special guest for the day, Professor Dr. Jyoti Kotwal. Dr. Jyoti Kotwal is Professor and Head, Department of Hematology at Sir Gangaram Hospital and GRI PM. ER, Kripmar, New Delhi. It's my privilege to invite her to inaugurate our webinar and give some words of wisdom. Over to you, Professor Dr. Jyoti Kotwal. Uh, at the onset, I'm very thankful to Dr. M.B. Agarwal, who organizes such fantastic teaching sessions, and he has called me as a uh, guest, uh, chief guest or something for the conference, but I think I'm a student of hematology and I'll always remain a student of hematology. Uh, coming to the topic for today, it's a very, very topical subject by Dr. Desh Pandey. It's very important. You know, I go back to the days when in 2000, 99-2000, Dr. Rajat Kumar, you must be all knowing him. He's head of hematology and bone marrow transplant now in Toronto, Canada. He came back from the UK and we started doing cryopreservation and stem, of stem cells and cord blood and started the first stem cell transplant in the Army Hospital RR way back in 2000. And from those days, we come back to come to today where 
uh, there's a lot of advancement in the field of transfusion medicine. It's a super speci it's a speciality in itself. Those days it was pathologists or hematologists who were also practicing transfusion medicine. Now it's a full-fledged uh, speciality in itself. And for a clinical hematologist, it's a major support, especially now in with so many transplant centers coming up all over the country. It is the pre-transplant, -trans uh, transplant and post-transplant support. You know, it's very, very important. Like when I moved into Gangaram Hospital uh, in hematology and we have the transplant also, we had the team and we have the DNB super speciality, we realized academics in transplant, uh, transfusion is so important because we realized that the if a uh, transfusion center is not really academic, then the decision of what products to be given pre-transplant, during the transplant and went to shift into the donor kind of, especially in allogenic transplant is a major issue which is faced. So, you know, we had to make the charts and put it in the stem cell for my fellows and residents not to be the ones guiding the transfusion department. So academics and advancement in transfusion and for the clinical hematologist to even understand what he needs. And supposing it's a major mismatch with the O group donor, then what is the RBC transfusion he requires? What is the platelet transfusion he requires is very, very important. When it is to be, and in a minor mismatch, it is the opposite. So how to go about it? And I'm sure these will be the things which also will be discussed today by Dr. Desh Pandey. And also the issues of, uh, you know, passenger donor lymphocytes causing problems and how to overcome that and how to decide to give appropriate blood transfusion, as like we say, not excessive transfusion and what exactly should be given when. And then in consultative hematology also comes in the issue now. We know that in PPH earlier, we used to give, you know, all mix of platelets and plasma and uh, RBCs. But today we know it's very, very important. Most important is fibrinogen. And it's the crashing fibrinogen. The normal value of fibrinogen in third trimester is four to eight grams per deciliter. So if it's less than two, which is normal otherwise, it is 100% positive predictive of a severe PPH. So the mega cryos coming from the blood bank and correction accordingly on the basis of fibrinogen. So things have changed tremendously in the field of hematology, consultative clinical hematology, basic clinical hematology, where we just go into the transplant part. And transfusion medicine has a massive role to play. And I'm so happy that Dr. Agarwal and the Mumbai hematology group thought of is this topic because it's such an important topic and I'm looking forward to what Dr. Deshpande tells us today. So I will not stand between the audience and Dr. Deshpande and uh, hand over the stage to him. Thank you so much, Professor Jyoti ma'am for that kind words of wisdom. Now it's a time to introduce our guest speaker for the day. Dr. Anand Deshpande from Mahim. Dr. Anand Deshpande, he is consultant hematopathologist and in charge transfusion medicine and HLA lab at PD Hinduja National Hospital, Mumbai since last 28 years. He did his post graduation in pathology from Nagpur University. Subsequently, he did his senior residency in hematology at PGI Chandigarh. He has been trained in peripheral blood stem cell transplant at University of Minnesota, Minneapolis, USA. He has also undergone advanced training in transfusion medicine at Wells Blood Services, Pradeep, UK. He is recipient of prestigious BGRC Oration of Mumbai Hematology Group in 2007. He is recipient of prestigious Dr. H. M. Bhatia Oration in 2019. He has been recognized as a teacher for MSc Applied Biology of Mumbai University. He has carried out one of the first therapeutic plasma exchange procedures in India in 1993. He also subsequently carried out the first therapeutic exchange prax using cell separator in India in 2000. He also heads the NET laboratory, the first in Western India. He also heads the HLA laboratory, the first NABL accredited hospital-based lab in Western India. Over 10 students and technologists of Dr. Desh Pandey have received Harold Gunson International Fellowship. He is NABL assessor and CAP certified international inspector. His areas of interest are blood component therapy, apheresis, immunohematology, and HLA. So far, he has delivered over 300 guest lectures. 
Well, over to you, Dr. Deshpande, for your lecture. Thank you so much from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amit, for your introduction. Thanks a lot. First of all, let me thank uh, Dr. M.B. Agarwal, uh, with whom uh, sort of I have been associated for last almost 30 years. And uh, we have been interacting in Mumbai. And he is doing such a fantastic job with this Mumbai Hematology Group lecture series. I also thank Dr. Jyoti for her kind words. And uh, I, I'm really, I, I, I feel that I can do a little justice to the topic as I am trained a little bit in hematology also. Uh, I was trained in hematology at PGI under Professor, late Professor Kesi Das and Dr. Deepika Mohanty. And of course, my great colleague, Dr. Kanjan Ghosh, along with Dr. Kanjan Ghosh. So I consider myself uh, as a jack of all. So I can do a little bit of justice to this topic. I was very excited to, I am very excited to talk about this topic because so many advances have taken place in transfusion medicine, say in last couple of decades. Initially, uh, I thought I will take only a couple of topics, uh, but then I realized if I do that, it will be a little boring for many of the listeners. So I, I will try to cover up many advances that have taken place in transfusion medicine. And uh, of course, I will not stick to a little bit of transplant because there are many uh, non-transplant hematologists would be there. So I will try to cover up all the aspects uh, and I will try to do the justice to the topic. And I must also thank uh, Intas for this and uh, Mr. Kalpesh who has been uh, sort of helping a lot with this presentation. So thanks, let's uh, move on to the topic. Uh, I will share the screen, hopefully it should work. Uh, are my slides visible, please, Dr. Amit? Yes, yes, it's visible. You can just put it in full screen. Yeah. yeah. Now is it full screen? No, no, yet not. Not yet. One second, I'll just rectify that if it is. Yes, now it's full screen. Now it's full screen. Thank you. Yes. And I'm audible clearly? Very clear. Thank you very much. So let's start with the topic. Uh, basically, as I said, oh. Uh, transfusion is a really common therapy and key component in every hematologist practice. There is no doubt about it. Uh, there is a small study which was reported in which 149 hematology trainees from 17 international sites were assessed. And conclusion was that the performance was poor because they performed quite poorly specifically with uh, questions related to tra uh, trolley and TACO. Uh, but I'm sure and I know by experience that Indian hematologists have far better understanding of transfusion medicine. Because in India, we really do work in hematology and transfusion medicine. So we have a, quite a great understanding of transfusion medicine also. Just to summarize the process of transfusion uh, medicine, what happens? It starts with the blood donors. Okay, We take a lot of blood donors, a lot of effort in counseling the donors taking the full care for the blood donation. Then blood is collected with strict aseptic techniques. Of course, there is effective donor selection and we have very stringent questionnaire and examination. Then it goes for the processing where we do all the red cell antibody screening, which we'll cover today. Antibody screening and blood groups and all those sorts of things. Then of course, the mandatory TTI testing, which uh, Indian FDA uh, has five tests like HIV, HBV, HCV, malaria and VDRL. Then, of course, in parallel, this blood is also processed for fractionation. That means the component preparation. So, all components are prepared. And this is how the in the blood center. 
then of course the storage which is also a very critical aspect with a central monitoring system that is also very important and these blood and blood components are issued and they are transfused under supervision with uh, strict forms are filled and everything is done properly and at the end uh, either the transfusion takes place smoothly or if there is any adverse reaction which is reported back to the transfusion center this is just to show the workflow which happens with the transfusion medicine of course uh, i'm not going to go into history but it's exactly not known by whom and when the idea of transfusion of blood was developed as the literature says pope in 1492 was given a uh, blood unit from three young boys of course everyone died but uh, later on there were great developments there were great names the, everybody knows about carl landsteiner and the others who contributed in the fantastic way to the development of transfusion medicine so let's come to the first part of my lecture today donors now hematologist will ask me why are, am i boring them with the donors because that they form the backbone the voluntary non remunerative blood donors repeat voluntary you know uh, are the backbones of our transfusion medicine right and uh, we we i believe personally in the foot in the door approach that been asking for donation directly problem is giving the brochures and generalized statements doesn't help and there i need a lot of help from uh, my hematology colleagues also particularly with recruitment of aphoristic donors platelet aphoresis which is so common but it's not easy the number of donors is not that great so there we required we need to do a lot of counseling which is possible only with your cooperation uh, other difficult situation uh, like granulocytes this is very important because they need a lot of uh, counseling and uh, they also have to be given as you know the gcsf and those injections and so, so they need a lot of counseling there i need your help of course bone marrow donors you people are involved in so many uh, stem cell harvest uh, harvest and transplant but we need donors for that and we have if you look at the all over registry in india there are so many the numbers are in thousands if you look at nmdp in usa it's in millions right they are all hla typed and ready so we we need lot of cooperation from you on that aspect so retention of donor is one of the key uh, criteria or the key thing which which has to be done in the transfusion medicine we have done in little bit i i will not divert from the topic but let me say a few words we are use artificial intelligence in transfusion medicine with respect to the donors so what we have done even in donor management we have taken the help of ai which is a novel concept as you know adverse donor reaction is the main deterrent if it occurs the donor doesn't come back for the second donation so what we had done we we take the image of the donor he takes a selfie as soon as he walks in the donor area okay and we analyze that his uh, emotion using a software now i can't go into details of that but this helps in predicting whether the donor would have any adverse donor reaction and we have uh, done this pilot project i had presented it in our international conference and uh, this is one of the first type and now we are working uh as you know ai requires lot of data you have to feed in lot of data to increase its predictability right so we are in that process at present so we are analyzing our huge data and feeding it into the ai and to see the thing as you know ai differs from other softwares because the data is the hardware of ai whereas the software software is the coding the code right and as you give more and more data i think we can predict better and better uh commonest example is the uh, chess playing computer a few years back any player with a, uh, a good player could defeat the chess playing computer now that computer has beaten even the world champion so that is the that is the ai and the power of ai so i just want to mention that i'm not going to talk about ai or our finding but it has helped us okay and uh, the in donor retention that's sort of our aim is so ai can be used in many ways in transfusion medicine but of course first it needs a digitization so all transfusion centers will have to use the software to reach this stage okay so coming back to our topic uh, our aim is of course to ensure that enough blood is given to replenish any blood that is lost right and we always believe in safe transfusion so no hazard of infection and should not evoke any reaction in the recipient now about the components 
as Dr. Jyoti said, there are a lot of modifications which are taking place. So I will just go through quickly. I'm not going to tell you about how to use it, everything. Uh, only thing as far as the pack traces are concerned, one unit will increase the hemoglobin by one gram per cent. Shelf life is around 35 days, but if you use additive solution, it goes to around 42 days and storage is at two to six degrees centigrade. This storage is very important because you can't ask the blood on the floor and keep it at the bedside for a half an hour or one hour and then transfuse. So that's why the, that point I brought in. Indications, I'm not going to discuss with you. You all know when to transfuse RPR. This is. Transfusion trigger, yes, we all know. Uh, we don't follow that Mayo Clinic magic of 10 gram percent, isn't it? Uh, so we more or less follow these guidelines, which are very old, but still uh, uh, anesthesia guidelines. And nobody transfuses if the hemoglobin is more than 10 gram, but almost always transfuses when the hemoglobin is less than 10 gram. Is the uh, problem between the 6 to 10 gram or 6 to 8, which every center uh, does their own uh, study and find out their own uh, cutoff limit. As you all know, trick study, a very well uh, a reputed study, old but still a whole, that restricted transfusions has got a better survival, better, less mortality. Okay, isn't it? And uh, even overall critically ill patient who received red blood transfusion had worse outcome. So lesser the transfusion, better it is, isn't it? We use a lot of preservative in this red blood cells. Uh, mind you, these are just to increase the uh, shelf life up to 42 days and provide good flow characteristics. They are readily excreted to the kidneys and they do not supply any excess protein. So just to inform that they should not bother when you see this red blood cell mixed with the additive solutions. So coming on to the next aspect, that is the immunohematological aspect, where I think I, sh I need to give a little more time because this is very crucial. Whenever a patient gets admitted, we do a blood grouping, we do a cross-matching, but we also carry out unexpected antibody screening. Now, what it is, as you all know, allo antibodies and autoantibodies, they are important. Allo antibodies is which is as a result of accidental or planned immunization of individual. Autoantibodies are naturally, which are the normal constitution individual by whom the antibodies are formed. This is just a pictorial presentation of autoantibodies and allo antibodies. Are what is the clinically significant antibody? Because we see a lot of antibodies which are react to room temperature and uh, which are IgM, which are clinically not significant. So basically, any antibody which is sensitizing the red cell at 37 degrees centigrade, causing a discernible clinical reaction, or causing a signs of hemolytic anemia, or cause the decreased survival of the transfusion. I think if these criteria fulfill, these are the clinically significant antibodies. And in our practice, which are the clinically significant, are, these are the main ones from the RH group. Uh, it's not only anti-D antibodies, but a lot of uh, important are the anti-C, anti-capital C, anti-capital E, anti-little C, little E. These are very significant clinically to cause hemolytic anemia. Even. Then Kale system antibodies, Duffy system, Kid system, and even MNS system, a particularly anti-M antibody, which are normally reactive room temperature are not very significant, but they sometimes have a biophysic reaction and they react at 37. In fact, we had published our series of such cases uh, some years back, five to six years back in uh, Asian Journal of Transfusion Sciences, the, where we got a lot of anti-M antibody which were active at 37 degrees. So this antibody screen, which I talked about, do we really need it? Because yes, if you see, a lot of pregnant women have so many antibodies, almost 10% had these antibodies. If you even look at the donors, though this is an old paper, they, they showed that uh, almost 0.26% of donors had antibodies. Uh, when we analyze our data, we got 79 out of uh, close to 59,000, that is 0.13%. But these donors had antibodies. Do we know what is the frequency and distribution of antibodies in India? Is it same throughout India? Is it same, say, in the northern part and same in the south part or the eastern part? How big is the mismatch between the antigen frequency? Or are there any antigens that have low frequency in most parts, but have a higher than normal frequency in parts in India? So we, we need to find out answer to this question. And that's why all the centers do need to carry out antibody screening. So what is this antibody screening? The first stage we do, we look for antibodies. 
Now, how do we look for antibodies? Is the test which you ask for like direct Kuhn's test and indirect Kuhn's test? Which are the tests which which will tell us whether the antibodies are present or there? Now, what what we do? If we find them, we need to react appropriately. Now, what I mean by reacting appropriately, that means depending on the specificity of the antibody, we need to give antigen negative blood. So, for example, in this chart, as we see, if I see anti like the first one, anti small c antibody, if we detect it, if we identify it, then I need to give a blood to that patient, which will have big c antibody, a uh, big c antigen, and won't have the little c antigen in that blood. So that is like reacting appropriately. Uh, there will be combination of antibodies like uh, little c plus d antibodies. So then accordingly we choose the donor. So how is it possible? It is possible by phenotyping all the donors. Which uh, I'm happy to say that in our centers we have been doing it for some years now, where all the donors are phenotyped. So I know their phenotype, and then I can accordingly manage these patients with uh, immune immune hematological problems. One has to know the antigen frequency in our population. This is very important. All of us know about D antigen, which is close to 90%. But what is bothering me is the small e or little e antigen frequency, which is close to around 98% in the population. Now, what is the problem? If you get now a patient with anti small e or little e antibody, the problem is it's very difficult to get a compatible unit because all the donors, 98% of them, have small e antigen in them. So that is the problem. So one has to know this frequency of antigen when we are tackling this problem of the antibody. Now you will ask me when we do the cross match, doesn't it take care of all of these problems? Why do we need to do antiscale? Cross match does take problem if you do a proper Coombs cross match, but not all the IG, IgG antibodies are detected. And it also detects some IgM antibodies, which are not clinically significant. Some weak antibodies manage to agglutinate red cell, which are only a homozygous expression of the antigen. Now, that is a problem. So when you do a cross match, if there is only a heterozygous expression, then it will not detect, there will be no agglutination uh, in the in vitro cross match and will have problem. So the solution is you do an antibody screen and also you do a cross match. Okay, that is the best way. And uh, uh, these are the three cell antibody screening. It's not at all difficult to do. Most of the good blood transfusion centers are doing it routinely for every patient who is admitted in the hospital. And that's where the role of computer cross match or electronic cross match has come in. Uh, what I mean by computer cross match, that is, if a patient is admitted, if you are doing his blood group properly, if you are doing his antibody screen, which is negative, which is negative, then you don't need to do an entire Coombs cross match. Because uh, if there are no antibodies and the same group, then we can pick up any bag from, uh, the, uh, from our store and just do a quick cross match. No need to do a full Coombs cross match. But of course, if you want to do this electronic or computer cross match, there are good guidelines for the validation of the software. And of course, good guidelines uh, that how to do this blood group or screening, how to record it. And there should be two people, competent persons to do it. And so there are a lot of guidelines. If they are followed properly, then we can do away with the Coombs cross match and do a computer cross match also. So we have looked for the antibodies. We have reacted appropriately. Now the question comes, can we not stop these antibodies, antibodies from being formed in the first place? Okay, that is possible. So that is, that is when, if we do a phenotyping of the, all the donors, because as you know, majority of the antibodies which are formed are against the RH group antigen or against kin, right? So RH group antigens, as I said before, means there will be antibodies against D, C, big C, small C, big E, small E. Okay. So if you take care of these antigens and scale antigens, then the problem of immunometallurgical uh, reaction are minimized by close to 70-75%. So by giving an RH scale compatible blood, is a good solution. Now the thing is, does it mean that we need to give it to every patient? 
that is a million dollar question the thing is at least give it to the patients who are requiring chronically or who are chronically transfused like for example all your oncology patient hemat onco patient who require blood transfusions repeatedly there i would definitely like to give an rh kale phenotype match plat okay or our thalassemia children right they develop antibodies so frequently so their giving an rh kale phenotype match blood will be a great asset so that's what i said here if you if you give want to give it give it to the at least give it to the patient so require multiple transfusions literature said that there is definitely a great advantage if you give a phenotype match blood versus not giving a phenotype match blood so at least give the blood phenotype match blood to the multiple transfusions and to the women of child bearing age group that will be a good idea to start with this is just the data from our center only since we are giving this phenotype match blood some of the children have developed the first antibody after 500 or 600 transfusions now this for patient number 1 developed a first antibody after 234 transfusions uh, he was of course transfused little bit outside before coming to us so uh, what happens if you take a good care on this side and uh, good care on the iron chelation then the, they do very well in fact two of our thalassemia children uh, in fact got married last month only so they do very well in their life and we do encourage that and find out the antibodies and try to give them the proper phenotype match blood so that was uh, basics of the immunohistology a word about the immunohistological anemia which you all know you all manage very well but just an example from a simple allo antibody induced immune immune uh, cases uh, to what i call a dark end cases simple cases means uh, like this case this is actually which happened if a, a person comes to you say for transfusion you get a reference you uh, for a some surgery surgery you do the blood group you do the screening everything is negative happily the units are issued and if he, he comes back after few months for say second surgery for some knee joints or anything you, then you do the antibody screen he is no positive blood is not compatible and then when we do the identification we detect some antibody and there we need to give antigen negative blood so that is a simple case which we face so many times in our practice almost uh, every alternate day and what i said but the dark end cases is uh, i had a case uh, with anti literally antibody along with the duffy duffy b and that was a nightmare for us because to get a compatible or donor with uh, absence of e antigen and duffy b also that was uh, terrible those are the cases which which really cause a problem and uh, that's what i said allant antibody is from sim- simple to a very dark end cases where we find really difficult to manage these cases as i said before for what literature says almost all antibodies are uh, against the rh and the kale if so if you take care of that almost 70% of your problems are solved we did our small data analysis and uh, out of say 9500 odd cases which we screened 93 showed positive antibody screening which was close to 1% out of this 93 79 were identified as allo antibodies and remaining were identified as auto antibodies and the most commonly encountered antibody was anti capital e followed by anti lewis and anti m antibodies a few words about autoimmune hemolytic anemia because this is also a case which we see in many of the children and here you know, i must take the name of a uh, uh, professor dr m r lokeshwar uh, because i worked with him on such cases uh, Uh, almost close to some 22 23 years back since 22 years back when we encountered such cases uh, children admitted as you all know they come with the anemia jaundice the uh, which a very low hemoglobin drop to say 2 grams 3 gram percent um, and uh, diagnosing them is not a problem definitely uh, and their peripheral smear is very classical which we see they have a lot of indirect bilirubin dat positive such cases and naturally you don't get any compatible blood so that time dr lokeshwar said and we we said let's try and and 
one thing I realize, one should realize as the antibodies which are in AIHA are Rh group antibodies mostly. And they are incomplete. They are IgG antibodies sitting on the red cell. What is the importance of that? So uh, first we manage these cases. At that time, we used to give list incompatible blood under the steroid cover and they did very well. But now we change our uh, uh, strategy and we are now giving uh, since many years now, all phenotype match blood under steroid cover. And I must say, all the children did very, very well uh, under, with this sort of management. Now, why, why I said these are IgG antibodies, which are RH group are very important, because they are destroyed by extravascular destruction, right? Because they are coating on the red cell. And extravascular destruction, if you see, around 400 ml is destroyed in 24 hours. So what I'm trying to say, they give you time. So there is, uh, we should not give up on these children with say three gram or two gram percent under steroid cover with transfusion. It's a life and death situation. As against the intravascular destruction, if you give a A group person a B group blood, almost 200 to 250 ml will be destroyed in one hour. That is catastrophic, right? But if this sort of thing doesn't happen in AIHA, which gives us time and we can save the children, uh, save these patients very well. So that was in nutshell about the immunohematological aspects of transfusion medicine, which we are carrying out. I had to rush through the slides, but this is how we try to manage all our immunohematological cases. About the blood component, just to say blood component is a very specific thing. It's a constituent of blood prepared from a one unit of whole blood, like platelet, plasma, cryo, red cell, right? As again, the blood derivatives or plasma derivatives which are prepared from fractionation like albumin, your coagulation factor concentrates, immunoglobulins. I'm not going to tell you about, you all know how to, in what condition, how you're using plasma cryo in such a big way, but there are junior hematologists and I must say that we need to use them in proper dose because I, I sometimes I see them using it in, uh, in, in sort of a pediatric dose as you call them. So plasma has to be used at least 15 ml per kg, cryoprecipitate around two bags of, or two precipitate bags per 10 kg, and platelets at least one RDP per 10 kg body weight. So if you're an adult patient with 60 kg, I think you need to use at least six RDPs to get a, a proper uh, response. For platelet transfusion, these are the guidelines which most of us do follow. I mean, for neurosurgery or such type of cases, we we have a threshold of 100,000. We don't let it fall uh, below that. If you have thrombocytopenia with fever or coagulopathy, 20,000 is more or less a cutoff. But of course, thrombocytopenia due to any marrow failures, I mean, your aplastic anemia, they move around with quite low counts, isn't it? So, uh, so it depends on the numbers are not important. These guidelines follow accordingly the clinical condition. Another important uh, blood component which I will like to talk about is the granulocyte. Because we are doing now plenty of granulocyte apheresis and using them in various, uh, various cases and they are of great help. Some of the key points in the granulocyte transfusion and minimum dose should be 1 into 10 raised to 10 granulocyte. We of course aim for high dose and desirable is 4 into 10 raised to 10 granulocyte. Here I need the help of hematologists to Counsel the donors also because they need to be given GCSF uh, at least 12 hours before we take them for harvest. And normally we give them around 10 microgram per kg along with the 8 milligram dead cell. Okay. And of course, granulocyte should be transferred as long as the indication persists. We do a apheresis procedure. As I said, we aim for 1 into 10 to 10, but now we are using uh, some sedimenting agents, right, during the procedure. Mind you, this does not cause any problem to the recipient nor to the donor, right? So we process around seven liters blood minimum. It takes maximum around 100 to 120 minutes, not more than that. We need to use it ideally within six hours, but maximum within 24 hours. It has to be stored at room temperature. That means around 24 degrees centigrade. It has to be abio compatible and all these granules said have to be irradiated to prevent THBHD, which I will talk about a little later. And it has to be transfused through routine red cell transfusion sites. 
So that is about granulocytopheresis, which in fact, we, we are doing a lot of procedures now and helping the uh, patients. Another important product, which uh, uh, has a poor cousin of granulocyte prepared from apheresis is the buffy coat pool granulocyte. Now, as you all know, when we prepare components, at the end, what remains is small buffy coat, which we discard, right? After preparing platelets and everything from it. And these buffy coats have granulocyte. So if you pull around seven to eight buffy coats, then you can get a dose of around 0.9 to 1 into 10 is to 10, which is quite good for the children, right? And this, uh, I must say, uh, this is a good way to manage the patient. At least uh, I would say those patients who are not able to afford uh, the aphoracid, women should try this. And I'm happy to say that we are helped uh, a lot to the Wadia hospital patients by giving them this buffy coat whenever granulocyte apparatus are not possible. Granulocyte transfusion should be considered when a patient has a pronounced neutropil. All of you know when the count is less than 500. It should not be given prophylactically to a patient. And here, as I said, the voluntary donors or relative donors, they come forward and the counseling then becomes easy and it's very important. And we always try and we are getting, when we have started using this sedimenting agent, we can easily get 4 into 10 to 10 granulocytes. So that was an important uh, blood product, which is used in clinical practice. I thought, which now most of the centers are doing it. So that will help uh, a lot to our hematologist friends. A word about liquid depletion. Because liquid depletion, uh, a lot of terminologies are loosely used, liquid poor, liquid free, liquid reduced, but liquid depletion is when we are using filters. Now, uh, if you look at historically, which is very interesting, because whenever I ask a junior why liquid depletion is done, the standard answer is to prevent febrile reaction. But liquid depletion did not start that way. As you all know, in UK, they noticed the cases of BAC, bovine spongio from encephalopathy. Then there was the epidemic in 93. This happened because they were, to save the cost, they changed the rendering process of fodder which was given to the cattle. That led to the survival of prions. And since the beef feeding was quite high, they realized that some patients showed the signs of CGD, Crucifield Jacob disease. But when they did the autopsy of some of the patients who were dead, they realized that this prion protein was different than the classical CJD on electrophoresis. So that's why it was labeled as variant CJD. Then when they looked back, they realized that it was sort of transmitted along with the WBC. Okay? So that led to a knee-jerk reaction. And every blood unit which came out of the UK at that time, or even today, is totally liquid depleted. And that's how liquid depleted started. Now, what does liquid depletion do? It removes all the antigenic material, degradation products, cytokines, cytotoxic enzyme, bioactive lipids, and everything, right? What do you mean by liquid depletion? As I said, the normally, if you don't do anything, the fresh whole blood or the concentrates will contain 10 raised to 9 leukocytes. When we do a filtration, it's brought down to less than 10 raised to 6. That means there is a three to four fold liquid depletion, which are the criteria which are followed by American Association. That if you are using a liquid depletion component, it should have less than five to ten to six leukocytes. Even if you are using aphoresis platelet, it should contain more than three to ten to eleven, and less than five to ten to six leukocytes. Right? Even RDPs should have less than eight point three to ten to five leukocytes. That is the correct definition of a liquid depleted product. Liquid depleted products are used, of course, evidence based if you go by, then definitely to reduce aluminization, reduce transmission of viruses, like for example, CMV, or reduce febrile non hematic reactions. It's unproven in TAGV in trolley, which we'll discuss a little later. Coming on to the aphoresis, again, I'm not going to bore you with the details of aphoresis, but what do you mean by aphoresis is removal of whole blood from a donor or a patient, followed by separation into blood component, retention of the desired component outside the body and return of the re remaining element back to the donor or patient. That means we can use aphoresis for uh, donor related as well as the therapeutic purpose. 
offer is just to take away it means to take away so for donor related purpose you can remove uh, platelets you can remove plasma you can remove granulocytes lymphocytes you can remove stem cells luckily of course we are used in for all of these indications in our center and most of us are using it for that way. platelet apheresis all of you know i'm not going to talk much but only remember your product which you are using for a patient should contain minimum of 3 into 10 is to 11 otherwise you get these newspaper reports or even tv uh, that someone has transfused uh, what orange juice to the patient and this sort of thing so we, we need to be very quality conscious and give at least 3 into 10 is to 11 platelets to have proper effect. advantages of apheresis of single donor platelets are obvi very obvious you are limiting the donor exposure you are limiting the platelet aluminization and of course some reports say that there are in good platelet function and survival and from donor point of view same donor can undergo the procedure within a week in fact he can undergo procedure as per the guideline at least 24 times a year now we have uh, using all of us are using platelet additive solution this is very effective in your clinical practice because what happens you have a patient with a group and you don't want to transfuse b group platelet which are there already collected on the shelf so what we do basically we are using platelet additive solution these are nothing but crystallized nutrient media and so we take out the plasma almost 70 percent of plasma is removed and we add this this is done sort of online when we are doing the procedure of the apheresis it's not added outside so there are no chances of infection or anything right and by doing this you are replacing the plasma so naturally with this platelet additive solution there is a low risk for allergic transfusion reaction and you can give a, a a group person a b group platelet without any doubts okay so that's why this platelet additive solutions are being used quite commonly they are very effective and uh, I, I think you should use them whenever you are managing your patients now the apheresis in clinical practice okay as far as the rbc's you can uh, do a therapeutic red cell exchange as i said we were happy to say that we are the first center to do it in india we did it for malaria cases we do it for sickle cell diseases cases as for uh, wbc's you can remove like cml with very counts in lakhs yes we are used them platelet definitely when the count go beyond 1 million we do platelet uh, removal also and of course plasma very commonly used for a uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura gbas and myasthenic there's so many indications luckily we have used again for all these indication in our center a word about therapeutic red cell exchange i'm not going to discuss in detail about plasma exchanges red cell exchanges photophoresis is being used now so but a few words about red cell exchange we we, we uh, did in fact uh, this is a publication from us uh, about therapeutic red cell exchange which was uh, published in JAPI way back in 2003. We have done even in sickle cell cases, just a case, uh, this uh, boy, 22 year old comes to us very often with sickle cell crisis. In fact, uh, uh, every year or couple of years, he, he develops this crisis even today. And he comes to us with this sort of a for red cell exchange. Just note that don't go into all details of the procedure, but just note the time. It just takes one and a half hour on an average to do a procedure and we almost remove the entire blood look at the effectiveness hemoglobin s which was 60 percent which comes down in one procedure to close to less than 14 percent so there is a tremendous effect when we reduce this sort of uh, we do one procedure and remove this hemoglobin s we had done in many pediatric cases also uh, who come to us in crisis uh, and they, it was also effective. Only thing is, in view of this pediatric patient, uh, since the extracorporeal volume of the blood while doing the procedure is more than 15% of the total blood volume of that patient, we do carry out priming using the cross match compatible blood. So, to maintain the isovolumia during the entire uh, apheresis procedure, that precaution one has to take when we do it in the pediatric cases. And look at the effect of it. The hemoglobin S, you can in one procedure, you can bring it down to from 71 to it came down to 14 percent. 
and in another case it came down to 31%. This is a very effective thing. So there was no major complication related to therapeutic exchange procedure in all the patient. I just presented a couple of case reports, but we have done it in many patients now, and they experienced dramatic improvement within the, after progress uh, a complete recovery within a few days. Now PBSC harvest, uh, as Dr. Jyoti said in the beginning, again uh, many of you are involved in the transplant procedures and uh, PBSC harvest. But again, you people are extremely experienced. So I'm not going to go into details on the transplant procedures or what we do, but a word of caution during the harvest. This is a small data from our center. Uh, as you know, say 20 years back when we, start, uh, we started our uh, transplant PBC harvest in 98. That time, of course, we were doing only MNC counts pre-harvest MNC count and we used to go ahead. But later on, of course, we moved to CD34 count using flow cytometry. So what we, we analyze our data and we realize that if the pre-harvest CD34 count is more than 30 per microliter, then your yield is very good. It's always more than 3 into 10 to 6 per kg, post-harvest CD34 count. So this is possible in almost 93% of them. So what I mean by what I mean to say in this is that uh, that 20, uh, at least you should have minimum 25 per microliter pre-harvest CD34 count to get a good yield in the final product. That's what I wish to say here. I'm not going to go into details of the harvesting procedures which all the blood centers carry out or the post-harvest procedures which you people are doing. Uh, how we are doing the cryopreservation of the product when we are dealing with the autologous transplant. Of course, this pre-harvest CD30 per count uh, has, does not have that much importance when we are uh, having an allogenic donor, right? Because then the counts are very high. But the cryopreservation, how to do a cryopreservation, which is very important, uh, and the storage also is very, very important. Then the thawing, we do a bedside thawing, which is also very important. Same thing is of great importance if you are by chance, you are doing DLIs also. So there also the calculations are very important. In fact, I was thinking the calculation in transfusion medicine itself is such a big topic, right from calculations of the plate, simple platelets, apparatus platelets, it has to be done very properly. Even your CD34 count, there are all mathematics is involved in every step. As I said, this is the, these are the guidelines, these are from the UK, that if you have a major incompatibility between the donor and recipient in the transplant scenario, how to use it, like in this case, if the donor is A, recipient is O, we use red cells of O, platelets of A, and FFP of A, some of the US guidelines say about the AB FFP. Of course, this is indicated, and this is how one should do it, usually, and then, Naturally, we shift to the, uh, once the uh, engraftment and everything is taken to, to the new blood group, which, uh, which the patient acquired. Same thing applies to the RH immunization. All patients who are the donor or recipient are RH negative, they do receive RH negative products until engraftment. And after engraftment, if the donor was RH positive, then RH positive component may be given at that stage. So that was in nutshell because I, I, I didn't find that I should talk in detail about the harvesting or the transplant procedures because you people are well experienced and trained in that. So I, I just took the practical points which at the transfusion center we do face and we, we need to do it properly to have a proper transplant success. A few of the adverse reactions which uh, I'm going to talk about now, uh, these are the classical, uh, as I said, classical, uh, classific this is the classification of the adverse reaction. Uh, as you know, immediate, delayed, immune, non-immune, but of course, I'm not going to details of all, but few of them which are clinically very, very relevant. So I'll just talk about that. A word about the irradiation. Yes, sir. PAGVLD, transfusion associated graft versus heart disease. As you all know the clinical features, you must encounter such cases in, uh, in your practice. 
I remember one of the first cases in this uh, in, uh, of PAGVST was diagnosed by Dr. M. B. Agarwal. Still remember one of the patient from Surat, if I am correct, Dr. M. B. Agarwal. That time around 20 years back, you had diagnosed that, and uh, the, the symptoms are really not very classical of PAGVST: a fever, a rash, GIT symptoms, liver dysfunction. But what is startling? Uh, honestly, I have seen only one case in last 30 years. It's startling is the pancytopenia, which happens and which ultimately leads to the aplasia of the marrow. And that is what the killing thing, that is the fatal thing, and uh, uh, which is very difficult. As you can see from the comparing BMT GVD, which all of you see in your practice every day almost, versus transfusion associated GVD. The mortality is as high as 80 to 100 percent, and people do try everything. I mean, cyclosporins and immunosuppressive, plasma exchanges, monoclonal, but nothing works in these cases. And minimum dose which is required to cause THVD is just one into 10 to 7. Is it achieved with leukodepletion? No, even filtration will not help in such cases. And as I said, normally, if you don't do anything, as I said in previous slide, also. There are 10 to 9 leukocytes in every unit we transfer, which is a very high number. Which are the blood components implicated in THVLD? All the cellular blood components. Plasma and crepicide, till now, there are no uh, sort of uh, confirming report that they will cause THVLD. Diagnosis, you all you know, clinical features, pancytopenia, aplastic anemia, skin biopsy, liver biopsy, bone marrow will definitely be suggestive of. PAGVLD. Treatment, as I said before, you try everything. I don't think anything works in this case. And successful prevention. So prevention is the key for this case, isn't it? It depends on the physical removal of donor lymphocytes. But as I said, current filtration technology is not enough. Situation may change, but to, as on today, it's not enough. So what is the alternative? It's the destruction of the proliferative capacity of the lymphocyte. And what is the treatment for that? It's the gamma irradiation, which, uh, which forms the mainstay of the prevention. As you all know, I have seen, uh, I'm sorry to say that I have seen some of the centers irradiating all the products routinely, all the say platelets routinely, but I don't feel it should be done. And uh, irradiation has specific indication, like people who are at increased risk of GVHD, like profoundly immunocompromised recipients, recipients of intrauterine transfusions, recipients undergoing marrow, umbilical cord, or peripheral blood stem cell transplant, or recipients from cellular component from the first degree blood donor relative, that which I will discuss a little later. So the key message is, if it is uh, immunocompromised, Yes, it should be done. So what is the dose of it? It's 25 gray. Uh, that is what we do. It just takes three minutes to irradiate any unit. Now, the effect of irradiation of the red cell that I just wanted to point out, you can unit irradiate red cell and store it for 28 days. So the storage comes down. So that means you can irradiate for up to 14 days and store for another 14 days. Okay, Not beyond that. Platelets, you can irradiate any stage of storage. There is no problem. Granulocytes, as I said before, it should be irradiated for all recipients. Uh, cesium-137 is the best source uh, of, uh, of the source for the irradiation. And these are the irradiators which are used. Uh, on the left is the big one is the from Brit India, whereas the right one is from the Nordian Sweden. So these are the irradiators which are commonly used by center. We are using the one from India, which routinely for our uh, all irradiation purposes. Now, few facts which I will to bring out to the, at least to the junior hematologist, that irradiation does not remove lymphocytes, hence it does not prevent aluminization. That should be remembered. It has no effect on transmission of infection. If CMB is there, it will be transmitted or it will be transmitted. And irradiated blood components pose no radiation hazard either to the patient or to the healthcare worker. That should be kept in mind. Now, this is just a pathogenesis for the, uh, as I said before, uh, 
TAGVLT happens in the immunocompromised recipient, but there is a scenario when even in, it can happen in immunocompetent uh, people or the patient. How is it possible? This is the and the one way HLA mismatch is the pathogenesis to explain that. I will just take a minute to explain this. Like this father in this case uh, is a patient. He has this HLA haplotype A9 B12 DR2 or A19 B35 DR7. These are the haplotypes. By chance, he shares one of the haplotypes with his wife, A9 BR12 DR2. Now, what happens? One of the children, child one in this case, will be homozygous for A9 BR12 B12 DR2, right? Now, if this child gives blood to the father, which is very, very common in Indian scenario, we are very emotional people. What will happen? The father immune system, now remember this father is not immunocompromised, he is the immunocompetent cells here. But he says that both these haplotypes are already there. So they don't do, they sort of drop their defensive guard. But when we transfer the blood to this father, we also transfer their immunocompetent lymphocytes since we are not done irradiated. And they realize this A19 B35 DR7 haplotype as foreign and they cause the attack. And that's how you get the uh, entirely marrow is wiped out. They cause cancer, dependent aplasia, and everything. So pathogenesis of TAGVD is uh, explained by this one-way HLA mismatch. These are the various references for the TAGVLD. A word about NAT, because all of you must be using NAT tested blood. What is NAT? Nucleic acid testing assay. So just to introduce you to the NAT, all the blood which is donated in India today, it's mandatory to test them by ELISA or Camille Emulsus, right? We look for HIV, HBSAG, and HAV. Now the thing is, when we do use uh, ELISA and Camille Emulsus, we look for antibodies or the antigen, okay? We are not looking at any other thing. Now, for a recipient of blood to develop antibody, it takes a long time. Or even to antigen to appear in the blood, it takes certain time. So that means that time, uh, so we need to detect it very early. And as you know, this is old style, but the scenario is the same. There are so millions of HIV, HBV, HCV people in the world. So we don't need to add any it's a burden to them through our transfusion transmitted infections. Even in India, if you look at the donor seroprevalence, HIV is close to 0.5%, HCV is in 0.4%, and HBV is very high, is 1.4 to 1.9% of our donor. That means if we don't detect it early, we will be transmitting it to the recipient. So what is NAT? It is a molecular technique that provides simultaneous detection of HIV, HBV, HCV, RNA, and DNA. So it doesn't look at the antibodies and antigen. So what it, what, how does it help? It, it's a highly specific and sensitive, and it shortens the window period. Now, what I mean by window period is the time someone gets infected, time it is detected. Now you look at the hep C. In this case, in a donor, normally by using chemical emulsions or ELISA, hep C will be detected close to after two months. But if you use NAT, if that window period comes down to, even this is a little old side, it comes down to now by latest techniques to less than 10, three days. So chances of someone transmitting the infection through the blood are reduced drastically. And uh, most of the centers have this experience now that they don't see the recipients of blood coming back with either HIV, HIV, or HIV infection. Okay, we started NAT testing way back in 2009, May 2009, in our center, and it has helped us a lot, and it has given us a lot of confidence in transfusing blood to the patients. A few words about other clinical things uh, which come to my mind when we are dealing with the case is the acute lung injury. Okay. Trali has developed from an unknown type of transfusion reaction now to the leading cause of transfusion related fatality. Okay. And this term was coined by Poposki way back in 1980s so that he called it Trali. A product implicated in Trali are definitely all PRBCs, FAP, RDP. So whatever you are routinely used can cause acute lung injury. These are the consensus criteria, which all of you know. It, it has to have an acute onset. SpO2 should be less than less than 90% room air, 
bilateral infiltrate no evidence of left left atrial hypertension no pre existing uh, acute leg injury it should be during or within 6 hours at the end of transfusion so these are the criteria which all of you follow but what i am trying to stress today is the pathogenesis why do that really occur and initially antibody hypothesis was proposed according to which either granulocyte antibodies or hla class 1 and class 2 antibodies in donor plasma react with the recipient wbc antigen resulting in direct injury to the lungs or inflammation of the pulmonary vasculature that was the antibody hypothesis but the problem with this was they didn't find the antibodies in the donor they tried all hla antibodies granulocyte neutrophilic antibody assays and it was not seen so then uh, this sort of two hit theory two hit hypothesis were put forward in which they realized the neutrophils in the recipient were already primed due to either infection or recent surgery and when they received the transfusion this prime neutrophils are activated by this either antibodies in the donor plasma or if antibodies are not there now they are pointing out to the role of biological active lipid and that's how the vasculature injury occurs and that's how you get the acute lung injury this is what is said as the initial the antibody hypothesis and the two hit hypothesis now the thing is uh, in india we don't see that many cases of acute lung injury related to transfusion the reason could be like i can talk about my central uh, our do, when we analyze our donor population the number of female donors is close to 10 to 15% maximum right so there are not that many donor female donors so the chances of some antibody production is actually uh, reduced and the second policy which we have been using in our center for last two decades that we don't use female donor plasma for therapeutic purpose we do send it for fractionation okay so that has helped i think this sort of policies and uh, very trained hospital staff to suspect acute lung injuries uh, has helped us a lot and of course uh, since i am heading a good hla laboratory also we we have the capacity to anti hla antibodies very quickly we do the cross matches and everything that is possible so i think uh, not using the female donor plasma for therapeutic purpose must be helping us in this way these are of course all the references as as for the transfusion related acute lung injury one of the things which is common uh, we which is not much discussed is the transfusion associated circulatory overload now this is diagnosed when there is a no uh, patient has no underlying condition to cause any overload and a presence of a relevant biomarker like bnp b type natriuretic peptide which increases almost 1.5 times in this cases so taco uh, is is now realized is one of the major complications of transfusion in fact in usa it is the second leading cause of transfusion associated death. so taco one should keep in mind when you are handling your patient coming to the last thing uh, i think i am in time uh, a last thing which i wish to discuss uh, is the uh, hemoglobin content based transfusion practices now you would ask me what it is uh, i will give an example in the last week only one of the patients who himself is a doctor whose wife is a very senior gynecologist she came to me and this patient i must say the case of md has repeated transfusions every month and she, then she told me uh, anand uh, she very senior gynecologist that sometimes you give blood the hemoglobin increases sometimes it does not she didn't say in those many words that uh, blood is okay or any or not okay but then uh, i discussed with her i told her uh, luckily we had done a small project on this because when we are transfusing blood we are just transfusing at one unit two unit blood that's all and we then expect it to increase the hemoglobin in your patient i'm talking of non bleeding patient right your regular patient who require transfusion so why doesn't happen 
because we don't take into consideration other factor like the hemoglobin content in the donor bag we don't take into consideration the total blood volume in the patient so what uh, in our center we all assume that one unit will increase the hemoglobin by 1 gram percent we, i also said in one of the earlier slides but we don't give any consideration for tbv or total blood volume in the recipient or acute so what i had done in last uh, year is that i had developed certain formula of course i labeled it as ad1 and 2 this is anand deshpande 1 and 2 formula uh, i won't be showing it today because it has gone for publication i'm sorry but what we do now if a physician friend ask me we like to just ask that i need to increase the hemoglobin of my patient by 1 gram per or 2 grams then what we do i can pick up a bag with a proper hemoglobin content which can be then transferred to the patient so the desired hemoglobin increment will definitely occur and we we did it as a small pilot study using this formula and we are very uh, happy that i did it in 91 cases to be frank non bleeding patients and in 76% 76 cases that is close to 83% we got it correctly so we, we this formula has worked we are working on a little bit on some other variable to bring it a success rate of more than 90% if we achieve that i'm sure we can use this as a policy in our transfusion center that we not only give abo match antibody screen negative nat tested leco depleted but also exact hemoglobin content no hemoglobin content unit to the patient and increase his hemoglobin this will definitely help us in our managing our inventory also in a big way so that is what we have been trying now these are couple of references and i'm so, soon this will be published uh, uh, and i will let you know and everybody can see that i think that's all i have these are all the beautiful live pictures which i had uh, from my recent trip very recent trip to masai mara and you can see how lively they are <laughs> so thank you thank you very much everyone and thanks for your kind attention thank you dr anand deshpande for that fabulous and very very excellent lecture thank you and it was a very elaborate lecture you in this one hour you i think you covered entire transfusion <laughs> medicine from head to toe sorry to bother you for <laughs> every point was so crystal clear and i think if the students have joined in i think they are 100% going to pass in the exam <laughs> thank you thank you so much sir so we will start with the question answer sessions now yeah i, I request all the discussants to please put the raise and sign first so we'll go one by one and you also so many questions coming up in the chat box we'll go one by one okay uh we have first dr amrita sir of your question please uh thank you and good afternoon everyone it was a beautiful talk by dr desh pandey and i am sure we all have uh, got some talks you know we are updated our knowledge i have a query regarding this technology passenger lymphocyte syndrome so uh, to my knowledge like we usually see it in solid organ transplant so i would like to ask dr desh pandey like what is your uh, what are your comments on this particular uh, entity and what is your experience in hematopoietic uh, stem cell transplants and solid organ transplants in your center uh yes passenger lymphocyte syndrome we all know does cause pro- honestly uh, i have not experienced it that much so i don't consider myself competent enough to talk about it to be very honest because i have not uh, sort of seen or experienced it that much whatever i have knowledge is the theoretical which all of you have so the, that that i am not the right person to answer this honestly speaking okay okay thank you thank you dr amrita sir of ma'am uh, dr venkatesan your question please yeah uh, that was a great talk sir my compliments to you this is regarding the uh, clinical uh, uh, indication of a versus which you had discussed Uh, i would like to ask uh, about the role of erythrocytopheresis uh, you had shown in your slide if platelet counts are high we can remove it by platelet pheresis can we extrapolate the same in cases of polycythemia vera uh, do you have any experience on that 
पॉलिस वेरा केसेस पर्टिकुलरली द ऑफकोर्स प्राइमरी पॉलिस केसेस वी वी आर डूइंग रूटीन थेरेपेटिक फ्लेबोटॉमी विच हैज हेल्प अफरेस इज ऑनेस्टली स्पीकिंग टू आस्क अ पेशेंट एंड आस्क हिम टू पे बिकॉज अफरेस इज विल कॉस्ट क्लोज टू इलेवन ट्वेल्व थाउजेंड इट्स पॉसिबल इज बींग डन रूटीनली अब्रॉड बट इन इंडिया वी आर नॉट एबल टू प्रैक्टिस इट ऑनेस्टली बिकॉज ऑफ द कॉस्ट फैक्टर बिकॉज दिस इज बाई डूइंग ए थेरेपेटिक फ्लेबोटॉमी रूटीन थेरेपेटिक फ्लेबोटॉमी इट डज इट वर्क so that is the only reason in india it is not being followed that much okay so thank you thank you dr venkatesan uh, dr tulika ma'am your question please um so first of all i'd like to compliment you i think that was a really beautiful talk and you covered so many aspects in such a short time very thoroughly so uh, one of the questions that i have is that we see many uh, aplastic anemia patients and one of the uh, serious complications that we sometimes see in these multi transfuse patients is that they develop a uh, platelet alloimmunization and that is a very difficult uh, area for us and i wanted to know since you're such an expert um, are there anything new that we can offer to these uh, platelet alloimmunized patients apart from the hla match platelets which as you know are difficult yes uh, in fact good you brought it up uh, honestly speaking today morning i deleted the slides of platelet refractoriness <laughs> because it is such a big and interesting topic that it would have taken at least half an hour to elaborate on that so i said no it is too much but as you rightly said yes platelet refractoriness is a common problem but uh, i must say we are not diagnosing correctly because if you want to diagnose the platelet refractoriness we need to do a correct cci corrected count increments in one hour or 24 hour and most of us don't do it i mean let me be honest because the samples are not collected in 24 hour they are not sent they are not sent then someone says are i have forgotten let's do it after 36 hour so we are on a little uh, sort of can say shaky grounds on those So unless we do it properly, first the diagnosing platelet right. refraction itself is not proper, easily done. Second thing, yes, we what we try to do is use the as you the approach as you know, we use the same donor or uh, same blood group of heresis platelet. Then getting an HLA match platelet is very very difficult because uh, I mean this point I had thought many times because if you I want to do. Uh, give a HLA match platelet to a patient. Then I need to do this when that patient comes first time to a hematology oncologist and is diagnosed and is advised platelets that he will require in future. That time only HLA typing should be done, which is not done. So what happens when he is treated, given chemo, count drop down, and then we don't get even lymphocytes to do a HLA typing. so it's very so it's a practical problem to do that in india i'm talking of india state okay. completely so it's become very difficult for us even to match give a hla match or not because the hla typing of the every patient is not done so from where i will give hla match platelets so that has become uh, uh, really uh, difficult for us to do that so the new developments are nothing new developments are the same we try to give hla match platelets that still works and that is the mainstay of the therapy in platelet refractoriness because majority of the antibodies are against uh, anti hl antibody as you know so but we are not able to follow it in india i must say that yeah. okay thank you thank you so much thank you sister want to add one more question uh, regarding this hla match platelet if it doesn't work then what the literature says to give hpa match platelet hpa match next are you doing that anywhere here see hpa matching uh, is uh, to be very honest doing hpa matching is not very difficult i mean platelet and because the pa one is the commonest one which we see so in short of that we can do platelet cross match again many of the things in india are not done because one is the cost involved and second is the number because they can, we have the kits for hpa typing now if i don't use the kits say within 6 months it goes west right and it is a expensive thing as on today so it, it will add a lot to the cost of the to the patient that is one thing i am talking of practical problem now we can do it or we can do a platelet cross ma cross matching also 
which is not expensive. Like whatever platelets we are giving, we can do a good cross match with the patient, is the patient, which is done. We are also doing now. So platelet cross match is a sort of a, a, a little alternative for giving proper HPA match platelets. We are not reached that stage in India where we are giving HPA match platelets. I must say that. Thank you so much, Thanks. sir. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rajesh Savant, your question, please. Uh, very good afternoon, everyone. And uh, thank you, sir, for that exhaustive and lucid talk. Uh, mm -hmm. My question is about uh, haploidentical transplants. These days, a lot of haplotransplants are happening. And uh, I would uh, request, sir, to elaborate a little bit about the importance of screening for donor-specific antibodies in this scenario. Yeah, Rajesh, you are read the complicated thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because I have not discussed HLA today. So, right. To, see, basically, uh, if I talk a little basic, uh, we, we do, uh, in HLA, we look for donor-specific antibodies using various cross-match techniques. Uh, again, I can't go into detail. It's CDC, it is flow cytometry, it is the solid phase assay or DSA by Luminex, we call it. So these are the things which we do it. And yes, in haploidentical, definitely we can do a donor-specific antibody detection. Okay. And it, it's not that if it is present, I don't think Rajesh, you we won't go ahead with the transplant, but it's a, it gives right. us a warning signal, right? So doing a DSA in a haploidentical is definitely, in fact, if I can elaborate not only haploidentical, we are doing it in many solid organ transplant also. Like for example, heart transplants. Uh, many of the heart transplant surgeons in the city of Mumbai send us the sample to do an elaborate screening and cross matching. And what once we get it positive, they are more cautious and giving the ATG or the immunosuppressive. That's how it helps. It's not that the transplant is postponed or is not done, but it definitely helps in the follow-up and the progressive. Because literature says that if you have an antibody present, then the survival of the graft is definitely reduced, which we don't know in India because we don't have that many years experience. Say, for example, in heart transplant, but it does happen. So I'm not sure, Rajesh, I can elaborately answer your question, please. No, I think, yes, you have already touched upon the point which I wanted to uh, get highlighted here. And also about whether we should resort to only the lysate cross match or use more specific methods like the single antigen free testing method Excellent. will be useful to every. For the antibody screening and antibody identification. Similarly, in HLA, we do the cross matching, we do the screening, and we also do the identification, which is called single antigen bead assay. Okay, so we know the antibody against the each HLA allele, like HLA A2 there will be an antibody, HLA-3. So it, it's specifically identified. So what we do, we do a virtual cross match because we have the typing available and we are of the donor and we have the antibodies in the recipient. So we can do even a virtual cross match for that. And that SAB, as he rightly pointed out, has a great role to play in this also, which can be done routinely. In fact, it's a good point you brought out. It can be done routinely with this, all the transplants. And we will be aware of whether any HL antibodies are present or Thank you, Rajesh. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Rajesh, sir, for a good, wonderful question. Uh, Dr. Jagdish Chandra, your question, please. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, my compliments for a very elaborate talk, uh, Dr. Deshpande. My question is only partly related to the actual talk. This is regarding the current status of artificial blood transfusion that we heard about uh, last week uh, from the news from UK. What right. is the current status? Yeah, uh, as you know, artificial blood uh, uh, production, I will say, or manufacturing all yeah. tried, has been tried since many, many years. People use lysosol, yeah. they could put the hemoglobin in that and then inject it. Problems were the survival inside. In vitro, they do well. In vivo, they were destroyed, right? So now this current approach, uh, from uh, Bristol uh, Center, blood group center. Uh, it is, uh, in fact, to be very honest, Dr. David Enstey discussed about it in one of our conferences in 2010. 
that this is going to be a pilot project. And so it has taken almost a decade to have a clinical trial now. It's a wonderful concept where we are sort of culturing and growing them in the uh, red cells on the plate. Like you can use hybridoma technique. Okay, you can multiply in millions the whatever cells you have, and the similar principle is being used. Okay, and that's that's what they have transmitted to the two patients in last month only, and we are awaiting the result. If that happens, that is something great. There is another concept uh, which uh, I can not talk with authority, but I can because I am involved in a small project, which is a very good project that we are trying to convert. the blood groups of any individual to o group what is the blood group ultimately is some h substance that with to which the sugars are attached so they have developed enzyme where they can cut those sugars so everything becomes then o group so a group will become o group if you cut a sugar b group will become o group if you cut a sugar so that is successful in test tube sample right now i must say that okay but if it happens it it will be a great thing to do so right now this cultured red cells and this sort of things are happening all over the world and soon hopefully when next generation will see them in practice also i thank hope you. Thank you. yeah thank you so much thank you so much sir uh, <clears throat> dr tejaswini a uh, goodie bande your question please uh, uh, good afternoon sir i would like to ask very basic question i was reading yesterday this uh, Uh, uh first option a uh, second options for prbc and platelet in one of this chart uh, the, this is a manual step by step uh, uh, of blood component so they have given the first option for ab blood group prbc is will be ab but the second option they have given b and third they have gone directly to o they have not uh, given a and similarly even for platelet they have given uh, for ab blood group uh, uh, first option will be ab second will be b and third as a so i wanted to know the reason why they have uh, basically yes that chart uh, which chart you are referring i don't know but ab group a can be given people have i mean we are using it a as a choice uh, i think it depends on the expression of the antigen on the red cells okay like b group they say because the Anti B antibody. I mean, the B expression is more. So that is the logic which people use. But still, in our center, we use for A B. First choice is A. Second choice is B. That's what we are using. Okay, sir. Okay. Ah, uh, can I ask one more question? Sure, please go ahead. Ah, uh, sir. Ah, uh, uh, regarding the radiation for the blood components. Uh, so they were telling that initially the equipment will be able to give the uh radiation in 3 4 minutes and later on uh, the um, equipment will become a uh, little bit uh, weaker and it will take up to 17 to 20 minutes is that true or uh uh-huh. so, I, I, i again i couldn't discuss in detail about irradiation but this is the source which is very important now initially people were using cobalt now everybody is using cesium so what happened is the decay occurs so the one which is the new one source it can do it in 3 minutes but gradually as the instrument the source gets older maybe what you are using uh, must be around 20 25 years old instrument okay so the source decays and so to do or have the effective irradiation for the same purpose instead of 3 minutes it will take 15 minutes to do Hello, that sir. they were telling me now it is taking 3 minutes but earlier it was uh, taking 15 minutes In the no. like previous Then year, I can't they, have changed, they have changed the instrument. That's what they told. I understood what you. Ha! Huh, because the decay is the only explanation for this, which is known thing, which is being done. Like for example, Tata has an instrument which is a couple of decades old. So naturally, mm-hmm. the decaying has taken place. So they will take more time to irradiate the same product, which a new instrument will do in three minutes. Yes, There is no other explanation for that. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. thank you dr tejeshwini uh, dr amita mahajan ma'am yeah yes. um good up uh, good afternoon dr desh pandey and again thanks for a very clear and lucid talk uh, i just wanted to ask two quick questions one any suggestions for the practical management of allo immunization because you know we sometimes get patients from other centers 
uh, with very high teeters and their pan antibodies. So just being able to select, you know, a specific antigen blood also doesn't seem feasible. And a number of them also sometimes have post viral infections, autoimmunization. So if there is an algorithm for that, and the second quick question was that if there's been any success in improving the shelf life of platelet product, because you know we've always been told that the viability is still seven days, but the shelf life is five days uh, because of the you know bacterial contamination. But if there's been any success in that sphere, okay, good question, sir. Difficult question. First thing is <laughs> success rate with the platelet uh, storage. Honestly, with the current, what we do, everything is done in a closed system, right? So there is no exposure to outside things. So according to that, even recently, uh, say for example, any developed country, they are storing platelet for seven days now, okay? And uh, I must say, we also are capable and we can do that for seven days without causing any problem to the recipient, which is possible. But unfortunately, uh, our Food and Drug Administration yeah. has to yet to pick it up. So Drug and Cosmetic Act doesn't allow that. So with that, we are storing just for five days. But we can definitely do that, I must say that. Okay? There's no novel things to be done in that. Only thing is every, there should not be any infection. That's what we need to take care. And we check for viability anyway. Okay? So all these institutes who are doing platelet components, they are quality conscious, so they do quality control, they do the counts, they do the viability, they do the even cultures we do. So all of all of us are entire record of every platelet culture report. So everything is available. So that way we are also geared up, but our drug and cosmetic act as on today doesn't allow that. Secondly, your multi aluminized patient, that is very, very challenging, I'll say. In fact, we do get a lot of referred cases because of this reason. Uh, my simple thing is, these are allo antibodies, maybe developed due to drugs, maybe due to infections, as you rightly said. There is a lot of reasons. And there are many cases where we are not able to pinpoint anything. Okay, As you rightly said, there, it gives a pan-positive reason. And we don't get any specific antibody. Then what to do? I mean, do we need to give up? No. Why I always say, if it is a life ended situation, we need to transfuse. And the best way is to transfuse RHKL phenotype blood at least. But giving in phenotype matched blood, I'm sure there won't be any problem. We have done it in plenty of cases, to be very honest, Dr. Amita. Uh, because there is no way out. We can't leave those patient to just go, his hemoglobin to go down and down and down. Uh, and it works. Give RHKL phenotype matched blood, monitor them. Uh, I mean, I have not seen any major problem, to be very honest. And they do very well. So that is the only practical approach as on today. Otherwise, I would have told you we should elude the antibodies on the red cell, try to anti or we do adsorption studies. At both those technical details, I don't want to bore all of you. But we can do that. But in pan-positive cases, it's difficult to identify. So best approach is to give phenotype. That's what we do. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Nidhi Mehta, your question, please. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you so much for such a beautiful talk. Uh, ended with beautiful, lively pictures and started with a beautiful flower, which I always admire in your uh, presentations. Thank you. Sir. So Thank uh, you. I have two questions for you. Uh, one is uh, you spoke about uh, red cell exchanges in case of sickle cell uh, mm -hmm. patients when they go in crisis. Mm -hmm. So what is your, is there any experience you have on uh, transplanting these patients uh, post exchanges or uh, transplant in a sickle cell anemia cases? Uh, sickle okay. thal patients rather. Okay. okay. Second question. Second, question. Uh, second question is uh, uh, how do you evaluate a case of delayed hemolysis Query, uh, no increment found in uh, hemoglobin, uh, barring the immunological causes. I mean, immunolo immunological causes are ruled out. But uh, if there are patients, a series of patients, wherein either there is no increase in hemoglobin or they come back to the transfusion center with a drop in hemoglobin more than expected. 
okay. and maybe one or two episodes of dark urine post transfusion maybe a day later okay again both difficult again, both questions difficult questions uh, 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 uh red cell my voice is echoing now yeah now is okay it's red cell exchange yes we are done in lot of cases but i must say i have not done in a cases which has gone further for transplant so i, I don't have experience of those cases i mean all this sickle cell which we had done they have not gone ahead for the transplant so i am not very sure but it will help since your center is doing lot of transplant in sickle cell them one must try this I mean, it's a good thing we will also learn from that but whatever cases i had done they were in crisis at that stage and some of them were for pre operatives and those sort of cases so transplant i have no experience of with the children going for transplant but should help that far i'm sure about it secondly delay transfusion reaction in fact diagnosing it is very difficult because what i always feel once you give transfusion to the patient uh, say maybe a post surgical case okay they go back they come back and see the surgeon say after 10 days after one week which is the routine thing of the screen is frozen yeah what to do okay because yeah. okay yes so they, they have not invited for a white sir sorry is your voice provide sorry uh, am i am audible now clearly yes, yes yes sir you are audible okay sorry so delayed hemolytic uh, diagnosing itself i find it very difficult that the surgeon or the physician will refer it back to you that look for bilirubin and look for this thing and then you diagnose a delayed uh, it's not easy i mean in my practice i have not found it very few surgeons referring me back to them that you please look for the whether there is a delayed because nobody thinks of delayed hemolytic transfusion let me put it that way so diagnosing it is very difficult and managing it if it comes back to you yes you can manage them well you can diagnose the even look for the antibody identification whatever has happened which are antibodies are quite specific in delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction but the question is that uh, barring the immunological causes immunological causes have been evaluated and uh, patients dct and ict negative but ldh is raised so uh, how to explain i mean what could be the causes uh, for hemolysis delayed hemolysis look if the immunological causes are ruled out then it has to be all clinical causes we have to look into whether patient had infection because the, even the medication which are given or the drug which are given if it is a post surgical case sometimes they got mar marrow suppression so then we have to think in those angles so it goes a different from the immunological cause. Okay. Can Because, some viral infections cause this? Yes, yes. That's what I'm saying. Infection, medication, drugs. So we need to look into that. Even maybe we need to do a bone marrow and see whether okay. some it has got become a hypoplastic. Because we don't know the effect of many of these agents which are being used. Okay. So those may may be the possibilities then to look into. So one more question, if I'm permitted. Sure. Please go ahead. what uh, cut offs you take uh, for avo incompatible transplants uh, do you do any uh, absorption uh, apheresis for the patient if it's a avo incompatible transplant uh, you are talking of renal transplants or bone marrow no i am talking about hematological transplants hematological transplants uh, we do it but uh, i don't have many series or cases to have experience of that so i think uh, for example in renal when we do the cut off is 1 in 16 roughly is taken okay uh, but, and, uh, hematology sorry. hematology cut offs i am not very much aware honestly because i have not done it many times but 1 in 16 should be enough even in hematology cut off okay. i will have to look into guidelines thank you sir thank you so much thank you ma'am uh, dr venkateshan your question please yeah uh, Uh, sir, we discussed about NAT as one of the recent advances, and uh, you had showed us uh, some pictures of uh, ID NAT. So, uh, what uh, what's your take uh, of ID NAT vis-a-vis uh, mini pool NAT? If you can shed some light. Uh, first thing I will say, any day NAT is better than not having NAT. 
okay yeah so whether yeah. you are id net or mini pool <laughs> is still good that is first thing so, i would say <laughs> and okay. then go into this debate of id versus mini pool it's a very long debate uh, yeah. or, i mean as you know there were only two companies in this field Roche and uh, Grifols for some years. Grifols. Now yeah. Indian company Mylabs has come into play Myla. with ID. Yeah. Okay. So that debate goes on and on. Uh, I don't mm-hmm. want to go into that. <laughs> but I I can yeah. say only Mini Pool they pull the six plasma or six uh, plasma IDTA sample, whereas in ID Net we do individually and detect it. So window period detection, according to the literature, a little more. With respect to mini pool and little less with respect to the ID naps. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Venkatesan. We have some questions from the audience now. Okay. Uh, Dr. Jyoti uh, wants to know that is SDP indicated in aplastic anemia patient who is going to start on immunosuppressive therapy? Very simple question. Yeah, I think we should. Or an alternative. I mean, these days what we do. we have got pulled uh, pulled rdps that is uh, i didn't talk about that that is also good alternative product now every center may not be able to have that many donors to have rdps D- pulling the red uh, pulling the platelets is very good because at that stage we do prenta leuco depletion these are nat tested and these are in a one bank so pulling the platelets leuco depleted is a also a good product so ldp is ideal but if you don't have it use pull for uh, rdp pull rdp that is a good problem thank you so much sir for another question from dr aritan jain he wants to know that how to diagnose autoimmune hemolytic anemia or interview dct who has been recently transfused blood product from outside blood bank see if he is recently transfused i don't think it is a case of autoimmune okay, okay. because autoimmune uh, I, I don't know. The question is framed in. Uh, I mean, I'm not able to get it. But what mm-hmm. I will say, or diagnosing autoimmune is not difficult, because patient clinically, as you all know, is totally that way normal. There is no epitomegaly, there is no splenomegaly, and uh, there is a classical P- CBC picture. So that way, diagnosing an autoimmune is not very difficult. You don't get any compatible blood. And when you talk to a transfer uh, transfusion expert. Uh, when they do the screening and identification they won't be able to do it right and dct will be strong positive now this dct will be igg so they have to do that also giving only dct result is not important they have to tell that it is only igg and not complement because they can differentiate between the two so a strong dct positive with igg with incompatible blood with a normal clinical normal in the sense normal uh, physical test is good enough to diagnose an autoimmune hemolytic anemia right as against that allo antibody will have some history of transfusion so if at all we want to do it uh, technically i don't want to again go into because we need to rule out first allo antibody in the our setup but uh, diagnosing autoimmune is not difficult at all and allo immune also is not difficult i mean i'm talking only practical thing not the technical things perfect But uh, will uh, DCT be falsely positive after blood transfusion? Uh, DCT no, no, no false. See, it's not all indirect. Uh, uh, indirect will be there, and direct. Even if there's something a positive, no, it becomes just one plus positive, which is really a little insignificant. So that experience one has to gain to correctly diagnose, and then to do IgG studies, and then report it. Out. If you get a four plus DCT with IgG, then you are sure that these are this is a problem. Oh, absolutely sir another question from dr arithan aryan jain he wants to know that if the prospective donor gives a distant history of childhood jaundice is he rejected from being a donor even if nat screen is going to be done as per dca no it is not rejected only if they it due to infection or i mean that means due to hbv or hcv they are uh, because as you know there are a lot of congenital conditions where in the hemoglobin i mean but we can dis- easily discriminate between d- direct and indirect uh, bilirubins isn't it so no. that way also it's not difficult to diagnose this and they are not different they are not different okay. perfect and the question from him again he wants to know that in a transfusion dependent stable patient who requires 2 to 3 prbc to achieve the target hemoglobin threshold 
should all the PRBC should be transfused in one sitting over four to five hours or spaced over two to three days? Uh, again, this is a practical problem. If I get a patient in the night, uh, night admission, then I won't transfuse all three in the nights or anything, right? Again, it depends on the patient's hemoglobin. If his hemoglobin is two gram, I will definitely go ahead and transfuse. But if his hemoglobin is say five gram or something and you are trying to build up, transfer different, then I would transfer one unit immediately but, and then I will transfer in second setting that way. First thing is I don't want to transfer them in the night. This is a very common problem with all the institutes. So I don't want to do that. I will do it in two, three settings. No problem with that. Thank you, sir. Dr. Jagdish Chandra wants to know, please elaborate on this computer electronic cross match. Uh, sir, it's a technical thing, basically. Uh, I would like to tell you, when we do a cross match as on today, we do an entire Coombs cross match, which takes one and a half hours, right? And which uh, you, you people don't realize, but it's very expensive. Coombs era is very expensive, right? And it requires a lot of instruments. Now, what the most of the developed countries are doing, when the patient is admitted, as I said, they are doing the blood group correctly, then they do the antibody screen. So if the antibody screen is negative, that means that patient does not have any antibody with related to red cell. So his blood group is done, his antibody uh, screening is done. So he's what we can say, pure patient, clean patient, right? What we do, we have all our donor data fed in the computers, okay, with their blood groups, uh, data collection, phenotypes, and everything, right? So what we, what I mean by computer cross match, then you just pick up any unit which of the same group, okay? You don't need to do a Coombs cross match because there are no antibodies in that recipient, so there is no need for elaborate Coombs cross match. You pick up any unit, it will be compatible. So what they do, they unit, pick up the unit, they do what they call a quick spin. I mean, just a, a slide cross match. Even that is enough then. Or a tube cross match. Just put it in the tube, spin it and see. That is also good enough. So that is what is called as a computer cross match. There is no elaborate cross match. It does. Only thing, software, software has to be validated in a big, big way. You should have a full-fledged IT department uh, standing behind you because there should not be any error. You enter A and become B in by the computer is not allowed. So software validation, there are strict guidelines on that. And as I said, who will enter the result, who will, uh, how it will be cross-checked by two person, two competent authorities, everything has to be documented. And I'm happy to say that my transfusion center is totally digitized. My technician does not use a pen or paper. We have terminals everywhere. So it's a everywhere software. We are using the software. So that is the first step to was going to a computer cross match. And till today, touch wood, uh, we are issuing every, everything is done by the software. Okay. So we don't, uh, we have avoided n number of mistakes because human errors are the commonest in transfusion. Even if you go to hemovigilance data, the 60% errors, even in UK and USA today, are because of the human errors, clerical errors as they call it. So we have avoided that. So that is the basic of this. Absolutely. He also wants to know, what is your take on artificial blood and how far or how close it is really being a reality in clinical medicine? I think we just discuss it some questions back. The artificial blood being made by cultured now and uh, two people have received it recently in clinical trials. So hopefully, as I said, next generation may use the artificial blood on this. <laughs> and we'll be out of job, of course. I mean, transfusion medicine people. <laughs> One question has come from Dr. Arihan Jain. He wants to know why is irradiation particularly recommended for Hodgkin's lymphoma to correct. prevent TAGVHD? Correct, correct. Good question. It's, uh, as I said before, any immunocompromised person has to be given irradiated blood, right? whether it's a transplant or anything. Now, Hodgkin is a specific condition where the immunity is sort of altered. It's not immunocompromised, but the immunity is altered and they are not able to uh, sort of defend themselves. That's why irradiation is specifically recommended for Hodgkin disease. 
Another question has come from Dr. Rajkumar Ramaswamy. He wants to know, again, the same thing, uh, future role of artificial blood and your comments on this stored trial. I think we had discussed artificial blood. It's not going to come in uh, <laughs> next 10 years. <laughs> Fine. Dr. Arithit Jain has a question that is trali is less common in neutropenic patients? Is it so? Uh, trali is less common in neutropenic patients. It's not so because uh, honestly speaking, uh, this, uh, I mean, we talk about neutrophils to be the prime factor in causing vascular injury in the lungs, right? But in neutropenic doesn't mean there's, uh, they, I mean, the neutrophils required number is so less that even if it's neutrophenic, this sort of reaction can occur. In fact, they are primed. So they get activated very fast. So I don't think, uh, I mean, Literature, I don't know, but I don't think a neutrophenic patient will have less acute lung injuries. True, sir. Uh, Dr. Ashwin Raj has a question. She has thanked, first of all, for a wonderful discussion. She wants to know that is presence of tattoo on the body contaminated for donation of the blood product? Yes, as per the Drug and Cosmetic Act, yes. Tattoo means one where there is a piercing take place, which we are worried and uh, so drug and cosmetic act as said i think is a three months deferral for that if it's a piercing it does okay because uh, if you know once upon a time uh, that was a common mode of transmission of hiv using the infect needle sharing the needle so that time it was formed so uh, though we are now people are going to very safe for places where touching will turn, but still deferral is there Minimum defer for three months. I think so. Uh, I will have to check. I think it's three months only. Dr. Vinayak Chikori wants to know that he wants to know about Bombay blood group. <laughs> how to diagnose and this and how common is that? I will have to bore you with a little technical thing. Bombay blood group, as you know, is a fantastic thing. In 1962, our own people from Mumbai, Dr. Bhatia, and his group, they diagnosed this first time. When you are working in transfusion center, it's not at all difficult to diagnose a Bombay blood group. Only thing you need to do a blood group in an exhaustive way that we call cell grouping and serum grouping. That is forward grouping and reverse grouping. If you do that, it's not difficult because in forward grouping, it resembles O group. So it's a classical O group. Now, O group person, as you know, will have anti -A antibody and anti B antibody. Okay, so it will agglutinate in reverse A cells and B cells because he has both anti anti. But what problem it does in Bombay blood group, it also agglutinates O cells, which we normally use as a sort of a control. That no antibodies should agglutinate O cells, right? Because it doesn't have A and B antigen on that. But in Bombay blood group, since this patient does not have H antigen, which is a basic structure, they develop anti H antibody. And these anti H antibody then will agglutinate those O cells which you are using. So, if you get a forward O group and in the reverse grouping, you are getting agglutination in A cell, B cell, and O cells also, then you suspect a bomb. And then you do the secretory and a lot of things, family. Yeah, that is the basis of diagnosing a bomb blood group. So, every blood, blood bank can easily diagnose a bomb blood group. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, another question has come from Dr. Divya Manohar. She wants to know that what is the difference between partial RBC exchange and complete RBC exchange therapy? Can we do RBC exchange therapy without aphidesis machine, like in emergency methemoglobinemia? Mm. Yeah, look, partial, a uh, total volume, double volume exchange transfusions uh, are, uh, are there. But to take the question that can we use it without doing aphidesis? Yes, definitely you can do a partial or a total manually also. But if you have done it in your practice, you will know how messy it is. If you actually do it, it's such a messy affair that you take out the blood from one arm, you are starting the blood transfusion from the other arm, and that patient is, is really is not very comfortable doing this procedure because they are seeing blood going out. It's, I mean, I had done it manually myself. And that's how I resorted or went to for aphoresis, which is a very highly controlled thing. See, whenever you are doing it on patient, 
particularly red cell exchanges, the patients are not stable. Most of them are in the ICUs, right? So doing it that procedure manually uh, without, I mean, that sort of a hemodynamic control you have, right? Then you are rushing in, pushing something in, oh, you are removed more, you are given less. And those problems are really bad. It's really messy. So I would advise if you have aphoresis, please do it by aphoresis technique because it's a highly controlled. There are so many indicators. There are so many sensors. And then you can do it very safely with confidence. That is on, on the thing. Partial and total transfusions are up to the clinician what he wants or the physician who is going to do after. Thank you, sir. Dr. S.K. Sharma wants to know, can phlebotomized blood be used for needy patients also? Look, uh, if you are working in transfusion, we have to follow the Drug and Cosmetic Act. Okay. As on today, we, uh, as I always say, we may not work with logic only. Sometimes are always there to follow the rules and regulation, and that doesn't allow a phlebotomy patient's blood to be used for a normal. Dr. Ali wants to know, what is alternative medical services to a certain religious groups who do not accept blood transfusion? Mainly, he's referring to Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah. Uh, nothing can be done. I mean, uh, we had had cases of Jehovah's Witness. They won't accept. I mean, uh, what alternative? We, dis we thought a lot, we discussed a lot, but the, the, I mean, he had to undergo a cardiac operation, but he said, no. I said, we'll go for auto transfusion. We'll help you with your own bed. But no, they, I don't think they want to be pricked or even given us even 2 ml of blood. So mm -hmm. I, I, honestly, I don't know how to manage this. I have no answer for it because those Jehovah's witness cases, if you see, they don't accept anything, anything. So uh, this is the big challenge in transfusion, how to manage this. Thank you, sir. What is uh, Dr. Vishnu Prasad wants to know that what is the platelet threshold for cataract surgery? Sorry? For cataract, cataract. Huh? Platelet threshold for cataract surgery. Platelet, okay. okay. Uh, I think uh, I one of the sites had it is close to 50,000. For neurosurgery, if you go, it is more than 100,000. I, I think for cataract, we are not uh, Not bothered even. No? Not bothered for cataract. Ah, okay, good. Other sorry. eye surgery, okay. Yeah, yeah. Cataract yeah. is a very See, simple. Major eye surgery, retinal, if you are touching. Yeah. I think then we are bothered yeah. about the platelet count. Not for cataract. You are right. Sorry. So this is the guidelines. They say nothing. To nothing. Do you are perfectly right. For cataract, I was taking it for the retinal or an, no, no botheration for cataract. It's the bloodless surgery. Yeah. 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 True. Doctor Mukul wants to know for a recovering patient post chemotherapy, what can be transfusion threshold, and is it different from that at start of chemotherapy? Uh, don't you think we, we these things are discussed? I mean, I, I was interacted between the uh, oncologist and the transfusion person, and then we set up because this is an individualized therapy, isn't it? If he has an infection, if your chemo patient is uh, immunosuppressed, I think we'll have a different threshold. But if you, someone is coming for routine chemo and going, uh, like for the CA breast patient or someone has who has required transfusion, we may put it a little higher. We may so not transfuse till it drops to seven or six. For someone, we may give at nine or ten also. So yes. I think it's an individualized thing. Even some JPEG guidelines I read actually, and that has shown some different threshold for neurosurgery, different for cardiac surgery. Good patient who got MI, all they were different. You know, sepsis early hours, absolutely, sepsis absolutely. late hours. Absolutely. So the thresholds are quite different. Quite different. Yeah. Dr. K.K. Radhika wants to know how frequently can we repeat the platelet aphoresis in a patient and many times can we aphoresis the same patient? Uh, uh, she's talking of patients. Yeah. Not a, can we repeat the platelet aphoresis? I think she wants to know in a donor, I think so. This has to be donor. Okay. See, uh, how the, the, can we repeat the in a donor it has to be? I think by okay. mistake she's in this patient. Yeah. Okay. The donors, uh, I had already clarified, he can come back for an aphoresis donation uh, at least twice a week, and maximum allowable limit is 24 times in a year. Okay. And we do protein, serum protein assays and everything because plasma is removed along with it. So maximum allowable time is 24 times in a year. Okay. But that is after doing his uh, serum protein levels and everything should not come below 6 grams per centimeter. Perfect. 
So another question has come from, I think, for a clinical hematologist. Rajkumar, Dr. Rajkumar Ramaswamy wants to know regarding TACO, transfusion reset related septic overload, common problem encountered. Injection Lessix is usually used to prevent it. Any recent drugs apart from that, which can be used other than Lessix? Uh, to my knowledge, no. People are using Lessix only to counter TACO. To, to my knowledge, only, only we are using diuretics. Yes. That's Dr. Tirumambet wants to know, can polycythemia where a patient donate blood routinely? <laughs> Look, if you are diagnosed the disease, I mean, let me put it, polycythemia vera is a normal, not a normal condition. It's a monoclonal growth of red cells, isn't it? So if you know that he is a deceased person, how can he donate blood for a normal recipient? Will you give it to your patient then? If your relative is admitted, would you like to give a polycythemia vera patient blood? It's simple as that. So I won't do it. So that's why I don't think we should be utilized for it. But why they have done for hereditary hemochromatosis, opposite way? Absolutely. Why, why is the guidelines are different? They can become the blood donor also. They can become the blood donor. Why is it so? Uh, no answer for that. No answer for that. I also had the dilemma that yeah, they, they do donate blood and that is used. Hereditary hemochromatosis. Uh, logic, I don't know. Let's start. So I think we have finished all the questions from the chat box. And uh, we have finished. Anybody has any other question? They want to ask any question, Dr. Nish Pandey, sir. Any question? Well, if no other questions, and even we have finished everything from the audience, I may say, you, sir, you were superb, excellent, fabulous, very elaborate. From head to toe, you covered everything. And how patiently you answered all the questions. You are really fabulous. Wonderful discussion we had. And Super, I may say. And I must so, say, I must Dr. Amit, thank you very much. You really anchored it well. I am very happy. I was really relaxed when because you were going through the question and asking. And thank you very much. I, I may have done it exhaustively because I wanted to touch upon various topics. But thanks a lot for your cooperation. Absolutely great. Thank you so much. Sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, so much. Uh, thank you I everyone. I now hand over the final vote of thanks to Intas Pharmaceuticals. Is Intas there? Yeah. Ambi Agarwal sir has just joined. Oh, okay. Okay, we'll. He's joined now? The audio. Okay. Of that team. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, he's, he's not joining. He will he'll, he'll come, we'll join, join within, I think, two minutes. Yes. I hope I didn't exceed the time yes. limits also. You are you are absolutely perfect. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Even in time perfect. Absolutely perfect. Thank you. He's taking time to connect the video. Okay. So and audio. Fine. So should we wait for him? I think. Yeah, he's connecting. Hmm. Did not connect. Something went wrong. Okay. Uh, Agarwal sir is there. Now he's there. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. No, he like I think he's, he's on off. Yeah, he's there. He's there. But oh, something went. Yeah, did. Fine. So over to Dr. Intas for the five word of thanks. Intas is there. I think uh, Intas people have logged out. Okay. So fine. Thank you so much, sir, for that wonderful discussion once again. Thank you, you Doctor. Really very, very good. I think you covered everything from top to bottom. <laughs> Nothing was left, actually. <laughs> so even EAG, irradiation, everything, superb. And how patient you answered all the questions. Maybe some were difficult, some were soft, some were easy. But you did very well, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks for a wonderful interaction. I miss you. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Right, all of you. Have a pleasant Sunday evening and afternoon. Thank you very much. See you all. Bye. Thank you, sir. Yeah, doc Hi, Dr. M.B. Agarwal. Thanks to all oh, of you. Oh, yes. Good afternoon, sir. We are waiting Thanks, for you to join. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I've been hearing as an audience.
Okay. So I, I just joined this side to say thanks to all of you. Thank you. It was great. Okay. And Dr. Amit Thank was uh, wonderful. I enjoyed a lot of learning. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And thanks, Amit, for conducting it. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Bye bye. We'll catch up. Thank you. Yeah, bye. Okay. Bye. Bye, everyone.